Ah, oh, Sai, this is the Sirens of Audio. My name is Dwayne, and what you just heard was the very first scene from a Big Finish audio play that I heard almost 20 years ago. 2002 would have been. Chimes of Midnight was brand new. I had someone lend it to me. I'd known that the Big Finish audios had been around for a while, but this was the very first taste that I had, and it was an incredible experience from start to finish. I'd never quite experienced anything like it. And it's like anything, when you have that experience for the first time, it's really quite amazing. You just want to go back that and you want to rediscover that feeling again. It's it's probably the reason why I don't like being spoiled with the TV series. I try and avoid spoilers if I can. And especially in that last series, there are a couple of revelations there that they kept back really well so that when the revelations occurred on screen I was so thrilled and so happy that I didn't know anything about it it was a similar kind of thing with um, big finish plays and especially the audios I had no idea that they were so good and what an audio to start my journey on it's still probably my favorite and it's probably my favorite because of the feeling that it gave me at the time. It was electrifying. The Chimes of Midnight was written by Rob Shearman, directed by Barnaby Edwards. I'm not sure if Barnaby had directed any earlier than... I think he may have directed a couple of earlier episodes. But this was the first one I heard of his, and it absolutely blew me away. I was hooked. I was hooked on Big Finish from that moment forward. I was so excited to hear Paul McGann as the 8th Doctor. Charlie was a fantastic companion that was created just for the audios. Even gets a mention in the TV series when uh, Paul McGann came back to do Night of the Doctor. And oh, just the, the feel of it, the vibe, the absolute horror of it, the absurdity of it. I just, I just can't describe I, I want to go back I want to go back there again and I know Rob Sheerman hasn't done Doctor Who for a while but I wish he would I just wish he would go back it's been an awfully long time I I don't know um, why he hasn't come back but it's got to be a good reason I'm sure but I absolutely love his stuff it was after this that I was able to start exploring some of the backstory of of the audios and in episode one of the sirens of audios I was talking about the audio visual stories that came out in the 80s that were started originally by Bill Baggs and Gary Russell. So I started dipping back. Some friends um, started sending me copies of those and I was able to, to delve into those and actually got to hear some of the BBV audio adventures that were unofficial Doctor Who adventures that, and they never mentioned the Doctor in them. One of those was written by Rob Shearman, but you wouldn't know it because it was, uh, it was written under a pseudonym, Jeremy Ledbetter. The story was called Punchline, starred Sylvester McCoy. You can get it from Audible. If you um, have a search there, you can you can get all the BBV audios on, on Audible. And I highly recommend them. They are as good a quality as those early Big Finish adventures, the official licensed Doctor Who product. And they're done in a really clever way so that you know that they're the the characters from the TV series, but they're never some aspects are never allowed to be mentioned. But the stories are absolutely fabulous. So kudos to Bill Baggs for doing that. So I want to play for you a little snippet of Rob Sherman's punchline, or should I say Jeremy Ledbetter's punchline. It's a eerily absurd play that oh, I could just listen to Rob Sherman's words delivered by anybody forever it's just absolutely incredible check this out so what crazy get rich quick scheme are you concocting this week well as you know dad i've had some pretty wicked ideas in the past and they've always come to nothing but this one's different because this one's going to work no because this idea is terrible more like a get poor quick scheme i'm telling you i cannot emphasize too strongly just what a bad idea this is So tell me, son, what harebrained lunacy have you cooked up now? I thought I might make a fortune manufacturing carbonated soft drinks. You know, like uh, ginger beer. I thought that was a rather good idea. 
There must be a market for it. Amongst people who, I don't know, fancy a change? Yes, exactly. Well, that's what I thought. So I made gallons of the stuff. But it's disgusting. Here, have a taste of some ginger beer. See what you think. <laughs> it's revolting. Isn't it, though? And this is ginger beer? The very same. Well, you're onto a loser there, Sam. I, for one, will never drink ginger beer again. It's mostly just bubbles and foam anyway. Look, I'll show you. I'll shake a bottle. No, don't! Oh, no! All over my trousers! And with all the synthetic colourings it has, a ginger beer stain will never come out. Imagine what that would do to the lining of your stomach. Oh, now, who could that be? Oh, it's Sir, I imagine. Oh, my God, gosh. Oh, Christ. Work here. Hello, sir. What a lovely surprise. Welcome to my humble home. I shan't take up too much of your time, Perkins. No doubt you're wanting to get your home fires burning. Oh, yes. That's a good one. I should have said that myself. What? Nothing. But I will be here long enough for you to take my coat. No, sir. I mean, yes, sir. Oh, sorry, sir. So this is your bungalow, is it? The furniture's pretty cheap, I see. That's good. Wouldn't want to think I was paying you too much. Can I pour you a drink, sir? Oh, probably shouldn't. Oh, just a little one. It is gin and tonic, isn't it? Yes, sir. Not ginger beer. Gin and tonic, sir. Then just a little one. No, bigger than that. You see, Perkins, disturbing rumours have reached me that you have developed a secret penchant for ginger beer. Ginger beer? Oh, my golly gosh. Oh, cranks. I suppose it's no business of mine what an employee gets up to in the privacy of his own home. But I don't like ginger beer drinkers. Never have done. Never will. No, quite right, sir. You know where you are with gin and tonic men. Sharp men. Refreshing. But then there are the ginger beer men. And sure, at first they seem bubbly, they have a bit of sparkle, but give them a few hours without the top on, they soon all go flat. Got that, Perkins? Yes, sir. Don't go all flat on me. No, sir. Ever heard of Cooper in accounts? No, sir. Uh, yes. I'm not sure, sir. He was a ginger beer drinker. You get my meaning? Perkins. What, sir? You seem to have a wet stain on your crotch. Oh, my golly gosh. Who, <laughs> sir? Who? Mm. So, just as I feared, it's ginger beer. No, it's all a mistake. I'm glad I'm here to stop this in time. I came over as soon as your wife phoned me. She was worried about these soft drink tendencies you were exhibiting. June betrayed me. June saved you. Not many wives would stick by a ginger beer junkie. She must love you very much. And though I've never met her, she sounds like hot totty. Unlike Mrs. Sir, who was built like a battleship. I swear to you, sir. I'll never drink ginger beer again. That's a promise. Not even if you fancy a change? Darling, I didn't see you there. Not even if you fancy a change? Kevin! You don't fancy a change, do you? I don't want a change. I like things just the way they are. In that case, I think I'll give you a promotion. A promotion? Well done, darling. Way to go, Dad! But remember, Dominic, never question, never want things different. Not when things are perfect as they are. Absolutely. Who could want change? Whatever else our married life may be, it's never boring. So the premise behind that story was that this character called the Domini which is another name for The Doctor, was trapped inside a sitcom. And the whole episode was like that. So dialogue like that with some really weird stuff going on. You heard the tape going back at the end, so things were replaying themselves. And it was a mystery set inside a sitcom. Who else but Rob Shearman could think of something so out of this world uh, than that? Uh, a fantastic story and i recommend as i said you can get it from audible just go out there and uh, and check it out 
um, it is well worth a listen, particularly if you like Rob Shearman's stuff. And speaking of Rob Shearman, The Chimes of Midnight wasn't his first story for Big Finish, although it was the first one I heard. His first story was called The Holy Terror, and that gets just as many kudos as The Chimes of Midnight does uh, amongst fans of Big Finish. And uh, I will no doubt check out the, the Holy Terror at some point uh, for a review on this very podcast, but we won't be doing so tonight. But basically, the Holy Terror is a Sixth Doctor and Frobisher story. Now, if you don't know who Frobisher is, he's a companion from the comic strips who was a penguin. So if you're looking for someone to do a audio adaption of a comic strip character of a talking penguin... Who better to ask than Rob Shearman? Um, the Holy Terror is absolutely fascinating and one of the darkest, scariest stories you could possibly imagine. I love the way Rob's stories start off really fluffy sounding and happy-go-lucky, but you can rest assured that they are going to get dark and heavy and will leave you with an impression that stays with you for a very, very long time. So getting on to the Chimes of Midnight now and... Obviously, I played that little opening clip of the of the little uh, tune with the ticking clock in the background and the breathing, the ominous breathing going out throughout that scene. But before that, I heard the opening titles for the Eighth Doctor Adventures, the theme that was written especially for Big Finish Audio and the Paul McGann episodes. Back in those days, they would do blocks of Eighth Doctor stories because he was the current Doctor at the time he hadn't regenerated into anyone else the tv series hadn't started yet so he was the current doctor so while they'd mix up the uh, fifth sixth and seventh doctors throughout their 12 month selection of audio plays the eighth doctor ones would come in blocks so the first series of eighth doctor stories was a block of four then the second series which chimes comes from I think it's the second story in the second block of Eighth Doctor stories. There were six stories in that. So you would get the Eighth Doctor month after month. So it was really good to to look forward to those Eighth Doctor episodes coming out every month. And the theme tune was done by David Arnold. Now, he's very famous, um, uh, a movie music composer. He's best known more recently for working on all of the modern James Bond films, doing the music for those. And what I find interesting is that Big Finish has at times tried to change the Eighth Doctor's theme and go to a different one. Um, When Sheridan Smith came along as Lucy Miller, the companion after Charlie, uh, they tried to change the theme music for the second series. Didn't quite have the same impact i felt um they kept that going for quite a while but then when the box set started coming out dark eyes they went back to that original david arnold theme which is the best theme and i can't imagine the eighth doctor with any other theme to be honest they've put a different theme on for the time war series but that kind of lines up with the war doctor who the eighth doctor obviously was to become And because it was so close, it was part of the Time War, they have a certain theme for that. But the David Arnold theme is the quintessential Eighth Doctor theme, in my personal opinion. You can't top it. I don't think they ever will. So I've got a full, unedited version of the whole theme for you to have a listen to. Let's listen to that right now.
Oh, you can't beat that. That's David Arnold's version of the Doctor Who theme for the Eighth Doctor Adventures. It was the first theme that I'd heard from Big Finish Audio, and I was uh, I was hooked straight away. There's a lot of people don't like that theme, and that's okay. But I absolutely love it. It's quintessential Eighth Doctor, as far as I'm concerned. Now, you know how I love my liner notes, and I've got <laughs> all the CDs up to... What number have I got up to? I think about 259 I've got up to. I want to read the liner notes uh, before I give you a, a, a uh, give you the trailer for The Chimes at Midnight. Uh, the notes that uh, Robert Shearman wrote in December 2001 for this release. He says, It's almost as if time warps around Christmas. It's only one day of the year, but I always seem to be preparing for it or recovering from it. I love it, but... Competing with hundreds of shoppers in crowded department stores always brings out the worst in me. I had the thought to write a horribly black comedy in which everyone got murdered in a really Christmassy manner. Someone throttled by a piece of tinsel, another having their throat slashed by a broken glass bauble. I considered calling it the Holly Terror, but fortunately changed my mind several nanoseconds later. From that rather silly idea grew the Trimes of Midnight. I live in an old Victorian house not unlike the one in which this story is set, and took to writing a fair amount of the dialogue with the lights dim in the middle of the night. What I expected would be quite funny ended up being something which gave me a few troubled dreams. I hope that just a few of my night terrors get felt by the listener to this adventure. It doesn't matter what time of year it is, Draw the curtains, turn the lights down low, even hang some mistletoe over your head if you feel so inclined, and imagine that you're hearing a festive ghost story with the fire roaring in the hearth and the snow outside falling heavy and fast, blocking out any means of escape. Doctor Who, The Chimes of Midnight Well, Charlie, where are we? I don't know, Doctor. It's too dark. You were supposed to be getting me to Singapore, you know. 1930, remember? An Edwardian Christmas. How lovely. Hmm. I never much liked plum pudding. Cook always used to make far too much of it. And we were still picking our way through it by New Year. Oh, I love a bit of plum pudding, though. Charlie, there'll be a death here soon. Edith, what are you saying? Who's dead? I can make you warmer than that fire ever could. Can't you just leave it, I said. I only wanted a kiss always been your favourite ever since you were a little girl. It certainly has. You'll make me plum pudding forever, won't you? Even when I'm grown up. <laughs> There'll be another murder soon and everyone will forget me. Don't you forget me, Charlie. Oh. Mr Shaughnessy, you're pointing a gun at us. Yes, sir. That's not a very nice way for a well-bred butler to behave, is it? You are not to go upstairs. It is not our place. We only go upstairs when we are summoned. Please, don't leave me here on my own. Doctor? Doctor, where are you? Of course, it's not proof. I mean, I suppose I could be lying when I said I didn't kill her. Oh, yes. As of course could I. Stands to reason. Once you've committed murder, a bit of fibbing is hardly going to bother your conscience, is it? It's mocking us. Whatever this force is, it's mocking us. Okay, so you know I love my liner notes, and you open up the Chines of Midnight liner notes. All the photos are in black and white, so obviously they were saving on printing in those days. If you read what's actually just looking at the picture of Paul McGann with his crew-cut hair, oh, why did they not use Paul McGann? Uh, uh, that was one thing about when the new series came back in 2005. I was so disappointed that they didn't use Paul McGann. They could have. What about his performance in Night of the Doctor? They should have used Paul McGann. He would have been absolutely perfect. Oh, my goodness. I don't understand. I don't understand why they didn't use him. But I guess RTD had the relationship with Eccleston, so that's another story. But anyway, it all, it's all worked out. It's all fine. It's all good. I just remember that feeling when it was announced that I was just hoping my fingers were, cro were crossed. I was hoping that McGann would get the role and uh, that feeling of slight disappointment when he didn't 
Anyway, back to the liner notes. It says, when Robert Shearman pitched his idea for the Chimes at Midnight, he ought to have known he was on to a winner. A mix of sapphire and steel and upstairs, downstairs, he said, knowing that they were script supremo Gary Russell's all-time favourite ITV shows. At an early read-through, neither Russell nor either Nick Briggs or Peg could quite believe their own reactions to the end of the opening episode. We sat there and looked at each other and then opted for a break before continuing with the next one. Why? Because the cliffhanger got our imaginations going and quite simply, we were scared. Thrilled and excited too, but really scared. And that's what you want from a script. So yeah, in preparation for this podcast, believe it or not, earlier this week, I pulled out my old episodes of Sapphire and Steel and I watched the very first episode of Assignment 1 set in that house with the kids and the parents go missing and that feeling inside the house of mystery and ominousness. Is that a word? Ominousness? That's That feeling that's in Sapphire and Steel is totally, totally present in here. And I'm not sure whether it's a, a case of Rob Shearman's script alone or whether Barnaby Edwards' direction has a part to play, which I'm sure it does, but the combination of those two on this story is superb. And I'm unsure why Gary Russell didn't direct this one, because according to those liner notes that Sapphire and Steel and Upstairs Downstairs were a couple of his favourite TV shows. So, yeah, I'm confused. I wouldn't mind knowing the story behind that. And at the time I heard this for the first time, I had never seen Sapphire and Steel. So this audio actually got me interested in Sapphire and Steel. And I went back and watched all the old episodes of Sapphire and Steel then and was absolutely amazed that I'd never seen this show before. I can never remember seeing this anywhere on TV in Australia when I was a kid. Can anyone who's in Australia tell me whether Sapphire and Steel was on here and when it was shown was it shown just the once did they repeat it what what channel did they broadcast it on i'm curious because i i have never seen it ever before this point but i'm so glad i saw it now and as i said in the last episode with joe litster i was very happy that big finish got the license to do sapphire and steel back then because oh man they did a good job of that was it Chimes of Midnight that got the first release on vinyl, or was it Spare Parts? I can't remember. But both Spare Parts and the Chimes of Midnight have been released on vinyl, and I can see why. You want a collector's item of something that is of a superior worth, shall we say? Chimes of Midnight is definitely up there. Chimes, Spare Parts, those two from those early days of Big Finish are always up there. And yeah, even the Holy Terror, Rob Shearman's first story with Big Finish, even though it's really, really good and it still displays his style perfectly, it's always chimes that seems to get everyone's heart racing. I'll give you an example. Here's, here's a portion of a, of a couple of minutes worth of dialogue between Charlie and the housemaid. What's her name? Mrs... Baddeley, Mrs. Baddeley. This will this will give you just a little taste of what to expect. And if anyone's that way inclined, this will give, this will make you go out and if you don't purchase it, which is very, very inexpensive from bigfinish.com, so you can have it and own it uh, as a download to keep, or you can have a listen to it for free. Yes, folks, you heard that for free on Spotify. Here's a sample from episode two. Girls these days, well, not you, of course, my poppet. You're a lovely little girl, I know. You want to ask me a few questions? Is this about your little investigation? Yes, that's right. Where were you when Edith was murdered? Oh, bless. Do you think you've solved the mystery yet? Well, no, I've only just started. Bless. Would you like a piece of my plum pudding? Well, no, I'd really much rather you just answered my question. Here it is. Oh, go on. Just a little piece. I won't tell. 
It isn't Christmas quite yet, but I know it's your favourite. I don't care about plum pudding. I just want to find out who killed Edith Thompson. Well, if you don't care about my plum pudding, I'm not sure I want to help. What? If you'd rather talk about a dirty, noisy, stupid little girl like Edith than taste a sweet, moist plum pudding like mine, then I don't want to talk to you at all. Go on, leave my kitchen. But Mr Shaughnessy Mr. said... Mr Shaughnessy likes my plum pudding. He always says so. On second thoughts, Mrs Badley, may I have a piece of your pudding after all? It looks quite delicious. Oh, it is delicious. It is. Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without my plum pudding. And I know it's your favourite. You always said so. So there you have it, The Chimes of Midnight, which is number 29 in the Big Finish monthly Doctor Who range. Oh, boy. There's there's not much else I can say about it because I'll just be saying the same thing over and over again. It is a wonderful, wonderful listen. You will not regret if you haven't, I, I actually envy you. If you have not heard The Chimes of Midnight before, I envy you hearing this for the first time. It will seriously blow your mind. And I, I, I totally recommend that you get some headphones, don't have any distractions, just listen to it, absorb yourself into it. It, it is an utter, utter delight. Still, my favourite. Did you get that hint? Just a clue that it's my favourite Big Finish audio of all time. That's not to say there aren't other Big Finishes that are right up there with it, but I think because that was my first, uh, the feeling that I had from it is something I will never, ever forget. And my goodness, you can hear it on Spotify for free. Why wouldn't you? Fair income. Get over there and give it a listen. If you've heard it before, get it out and listen to it again. Righto, we've come to the quick tips. I'm going to let you know about uh, an audio that was released earlier this month, the month of March 2020. That is the spin-off series Donna Noble Kidnapped. And that one is set after the events of Silence in the Library. So Donna goes back home for a bit to recover from that and has some adventures that carry on from there. Uh, Jacqueline King's in it, Donna's mum, of course. And Nikki Wardley, too, has a major role. And I won't tell you anything about it, because I can't, because I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> um, but I will play you a trailer. We can listen to it for the first time together. How's that? Let's go. From Big Finish Productions, Donna Noble, Kidnapped. I want to hear everything. All right, G&T, catch up first. Gorgeous guys afterwards. You have returned. I shall inform the others. And what's that? Alien, grey, spindly, short. Not one I've met. So you signed me up for speed dating? There was a leaflet through the door yesterday. And there was a leaflet through the door on Tuesday asking if we want our gutters cleaned. But guess what? Still got dirty gutters. Definitely handsome. And definitely not my type. I'm steering well clear of skinny boys in suits. Where are Quite shiny, lots of buttons, probably a spaceship. Oh, yes, if you look out there, you can see the Earth. Are there red people on Skegness? Again, depends where you go, if it's been a hot summer, so probably not. What's the naughtiest thing you've ever done, Ganthak? Oh, um, well, my mother once caught me scrumping in the neighbor's garden. I got a right hiding that day, let me tell you. <laughs> Oh, and I suppose I did also immolate the entire population of the planet Pleen. Ah, if it's any constellation, I doubt they're aiming at us specifically. They can't know where we are. Well, that doesn't help. I have summoned thee, Time Mage. You dare summon me? I have need of you, Merlin. Wait, you're Merlin? I am Merlin. Your grandfather's shooting fire from his fingertips, and you're asking me if I have any healing magic. I tell you, I can't. You have to, and really quickly. There's another you, and she... Wait, how did you know? Look at my room. After I froze your mother. What have you done to her? Big finish. We love stories. Do you remember when I wanted to bunk off school to see... What film was it? E.T. No. Beverly Hills Cop? No. Ghostbusters? No. Footloose? No. Well, let's face it, you did bunk off a lot. Oh, that sounds awesome. Donna Noble kidnapped uh, one of the releases from March 2020's Big Finish range. 
And that'll do us for this episode of the Sirens of Audio. Hope you've uh, got something interesting out of that. If you want to contact me, you can do so on uh, Twitter at Audio Sirens, and the email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Let me know what you'd like me to review um, if you want, and I can put that in the schedule. Be happy to take your requests because I love audio and I'm happy to listen to any of it. There are a couple of ranges that I actually don't listen to uh, on Big Finish. I listen to pretty pretty much all of them, except for a couple. There is a couple that I, that I haven't kept up with. You might have to see if you can guess which ones they are. Hmm. And if you can convince me to go and have a listen to some of them to review them. Well, there you go. I'm not going to tell you what uh, next episode's review will be because I haven't decided yet. You can follow me on Twitter uh, at Audio Sirens to find out. I might uh, pop a tweet in there or I might just pop up with a podcast and just surprise you. What the heck? I might just do that too. In the meantime, ensure that you listen to audio drama because audio drama rocks. Rocks. as if time wraps around Christmas. It's only one day of the year, but I always seem to be preparing for... It's almost as if time wraps around Christmas. It's only one day of the year, but I always seem to be preparing for it. (laughs) Oh, I can't do it right. It's almost as if time... Oh, let's start. Uh, It's too... The writing's too small, or I'm getting too old with my glasses.